what are some of the signs that your poop isn't healthy? That is left field. <laughs> and I will answer because do you know what? It's like amazing. Like people love talking about this. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. So I think the interesting thing is that everybody's gut is kind of variable. And uh, like it's normal for some people to go every three days and it's normal for others to go three times a day. What's most important is that if you notice a change in the frequency or habit of your bowel function and that change is sustained for more than six weeks, that okay. you seek help. Okay. Right? That's number one. Number two is... And so that change, is that regularity, consistency, yeah. all of the above? So it could be all of the above. Okay. So it might be things that worry me as a doctor are if you say, actually, I'm usually you know pretty regular and now I'm going much, much more frequently. So for example, I'm going three, four, five, six times a day when I would usually go once a day. Mm -hmm. Or if you're normally pretty soft and now you're loose, or if you were constipated and you're loose, or if you've gone the other way, there are obviously other things that we worry about. So if you're passing blood, you need to see a doctor. Um, and if you're passing dark blood, you really need to see a doctor. Okay. So the, the difference is that, you know, bright red blood can sometimes be from benign causes like hemorrhoids, but you still need to get it checked out, mm -hmm. right? Dark blood means that maybe something's bleeding a bit higher up the system and we really need to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other changes or any, th any other signs that you're... Your poop could be unhealthy. I, there, I think those are the main ones. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. In terms of um, uh, the the changes in consistency, let's say uh, it's not always uh, the the same. Uh, what's the what's the uh, what am I trying to ask here? What what about if it's intermittent changes? So uh, I've had a change. It lasted about a week. And then I'm back to normal. And then a couple of months later, I have another change and I'm back to normal. Yeah. What are the other things that you might be asking someone in front of you who's presenting with that sort of irregularity, but over a longer time period? So, um, I, I mean, the top line message here is if you're worried, go and see your doctor and mm -hmm. just don't be embarrassed about it mm -hmm. because your doctor really wants to talk to you about it. Yeah. And um, um, it's much, much better to get help than to sit at home and worry. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, it, it really depends on the age of the person I'm talking to, the gender or sex of the person I'm speaking to, and the context. Mm -hmm. For some broad, broad questions, things that I want to know about are, number one, are you having any other symptoms with these changes? So, for example, are you having abdominal pain? Are you having bloating? Are you having... Um, are you noticing that particular things are triggering those symptoms? So that might be a particular change in your nutrition or diet, or it might be something different. Maybe you've been put on medicines. And quite often there is a there is a driver for that, which can mm -hmm. be explained through 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 those things. I'm interested in whether you're feeling sick, whether you're vomiting. Is there something else happening in your gut here that we really need to know about? I want to know about your risk of infections, because that might be quite a common cause, but also your family history. Is there something else here that is perhaps suggestive of a problem that might be chronic, that might be familial, that we could that we could look at. Yeah, okay. Let's say you've been to your doctor, mm -hmm. they've examined you, they've excluded any red flags, um, they don't think there's cancer and there's growth, um, and they point it to lifestyle. They think it's probably something to do with your lifestyle. What are some of the lifestyle changes that you would say people need to lean into more to prevent uh, these, these issues with the digestive tracts? So... Um, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer to that question. And what I've learned in my time over the years is that you have to treat the individual and make an individual kind of assessment. Mm -hmm. The first thing I do in that situation with that individual is I take them right back in time. So actually with that individual, what I really want to know about, and this is really answering your former question, but in that very particular scenario, is I want to know what their childhood was like. Mm. I'm not Freudian, mm. but what I want to know is, was their gut functioning when they were a kid normally? Were they constipated? Were they having functional gut problems? I want to know about their antibiotic history. I want to know about whether they were an, an allergy kid. Did they have eczema? Did they have asthma? Um, were they... Were they um, were they someone that was always in and out of hospital with kind of griping tummy pains? And, and, and these are really important questions to understand because they tell us about how the gut was set up in early life and whether or not there's been some, 
some damage to the microbiome or damage to the gut in early life that actually we need to go back and unpick because unless we unpick that, we can't really make them better. Mm. The second thing I really want to know about is their mental health. So in patients who have IBS, and we can talk about IBS in a bit more detail, but it's a terrible, terrible name for a terrible, terrible condition because IBS is not irritable. It's bloody awful. Mm. It's not really a problem of the bowel. It's a problem of neuroimmunobiology. It's a, it's a problem of how the immune system interacts with the gut nervous system. So it's really about gut brain. Uh, and it's not really a syndrome, right? It's, it's not. Uh, a, syn a syndrome implies it's a collection of symptoms for one condition. And IB IBS is really, it's a m lots of different types of gut brain disorders. So in that instance, I want to know about mental health because quite often there's an underlying history of trauma. So, or there's a history of eating disorders, or there's a history of sometimes um, uh, neurodiversity that's never really been properly detected. And until you address those things, you can't really understand what's driving the condition. Mm. In women and, and, and girls, I really want to know about their menstrual history. And I really want to know about the cyclical nature of their pain, because very often they're connected. And most doctors just don't ask about it, or they just don't think to ask about it. And, and, and quite often women will say to me, yep, around the time my period symptoms get much better, or they'll mm. say they get much worse. Or they will say, at the time of puberty, things just really kicked off. Yeah. And that was kind of a real problem. And that's very important to know because you can do something about it. Like that's a lever for making change. Mm. I really want to know about their nutritional and dietary history. So I then go into a lot of detail about what they've done. And what you find quite often in these patients is that they've all tried really extreme nutritional yeah. interventions because they've suffered so terribly, right? So they've excluded a whole bunch of stuff from their diet. Maybe they've got really unhealthy attitudes towards foods because they spend a bit too much time on social media. And it, it, there's usually quite a lot of damage that has been done that has to be unpicked in a really in a really sort of considered and careful way. And that means I've worked with a big, I'm really lucky, I've got some amazing dietitians that I work with and we have a big team of us and we kind of bring in all these people to, to try and help. And then what I'll say is, look, the solution to kind of functional gut brain disorders like that is not medicines, it's almost never medicines. Sometimes medicines help and there's a role for medicines, but quite often it's about lifestyle, behavior, and it's about kind of pulling all of those levers that I was telling you yeah. about before. So it's sometimes it might be things like um, psychotherapy, it might be hypnotherapy. But again, you have to understand that those things are what I would call like marginal gains impacts. They're yeah. not going to transform everything, but it's just going to give you another little strategy for coping with it. It will almost certainly be nutritional and dietary, number one. And then it will also be things like exercise and physical activity. It might be contraceptive pills or hormone therapy in postmenopausal women. And it might be sometimes something very, very, very specific. Mm. So um, I increasingly, beyond doing conventional diagnostic tests, which we would do, I will sequence out the microbiome. I will have a look at microbes and we'll try and think about strategies that are quite focused and targeted to the microbiome to try and make a difference. Yeah. In terms of those investigations, looking at microbes, what are some of those tests that you, you would do if you had you know, all the resources available yeah. to you? So, so I think microbiome testing is the Wild West. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of really terrible direct to consumer tests, okay. which are expensive and you just shouldn't waste your money on. Okay. And the reason they're not very good is that the sequencing technology. So what I mean by that is that the way microbiome tests work is that normally what they do is they look for particular genes within these bacteria mm. and then they compare those genes to a database and they work out, oh, do you have this bacteria or do you not have this bacteria? And the problem is, is that that test is not very accurate. So it doesn't really tell you which particular species or strain of bacteria you've got in there. The, the, the maths they do on that test is very, very variable. And what that means is that you could, you and I could, um, sorry, I could do the test with three different companies and get three different results. Mm. And, and there may be no consistency in the analysis between you and I. So what I do is I use, a, I use quite a particular kind of product and I use something which I know is validated that uses a deeper level of sequencing that I can be really sure gives me the information that I need. Can you tell us what that test is? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, it's, a, uh, I use W, well, if you go to www.gutid.com. Gut ID, okay. Right. Um, 
Um, but but I think those tests like should be used in a clinical context. Yeah. Mm. I think trying to interpret them at home is just impossible, <laughs> right? And most of these consumer tests, you get like eighty pages of yeah. results, right? Yeah. And it's just bullshit. <laughs> it's bullshit. Like, and I can't understand it. And I'm a microbiome scientist, so I, how the hell you're going to do it? I don't know, right? And and I think it's overwhelming. And I think it, unless unless it's interpreted by someone who knows what they're doing in a clinical context, I think it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and again, like you have to understand what the test tells you and what it doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you quite a lot of stuff. Like these tests only tell you about bacteria. Mm. And there's lots of other components of your microbiome that are very important. And it doesn't also tell you about function. Mm. It's not telling you necessarily what these bugs are doing and how they're interacting with your gut. So the way I look at it is that it's a, it's a piece in the puzzle. It's not a panacea, it's not the whole solution, mm -hmm. but it's something that many clinicians overlook and don't analyze. Mm -hmm. And if you've got 100 trillion bacteria in your gut, which is like 30 million genes, which is like, you know, 300 times your human genome, like, why do you not want to know about that? Yeah, yeah. Like, you should want to know about that. Absolutely. And I find it quite helpful. Yeah. Um, and okay, so with regards to the sequencing or yeah. the, the different sort of microbial tests that you can find online, is the reason why they might yield different results because they're using different sequencing methods? Correct. But there's more variance than that. So the sampling technique is super important. Uh, okay. So like without wishing to be too crass, yeah, yeah. like uh, poo <laughs> is about 60% bacteria, okay. right? And these bacteria, when you have a poo, they don't just, you know, stop working. They keep fermenting and metabolizing and changing. So a, a poo, <laughs> uh, like it's a living thing and it just keeps, it keeps, it keeps altering and changing. So, and <laughs> the other thing is, uh, I don't quite know how my life came to this, but uh, <laughs> like, you know, the, the bacteria on the outside of a fecal specimen are not the same as the bacteria on the inside. Ah, there's, there's variance throughout the sample. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, that makes sense. And, and again, of course, the other thing is that a fecal sp specimen is only the output of a system. It's not necessarily telling you what's happening higher up oh, the right. tube, mm. right? So it's not really telling you necessarily what's happening in the duodenum or the small bowel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really just the output. You can mm. derive insights from that, but you just gotta be careful about what it can and can't tell you. So there is variance in the sampling technique, there's variance in the sample processing, there's variance in the sequencing technology, and there's variance in the analysis they perform on it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, the big problem is that the information then that is then given to the consumer is usually really generic and not that helpful. Yeah. So actually you need precision and that's why I use that test because it just gives me that precision. Do you think doctors, and I'm thinking with my sort of GP yeah. hat on here, are equipped enough, even if they were able to go and find a patient that's willing to spend the extra yeah. money on a gut test, to be able to actually interpret it for that individual? Because I mean, certainly during my GP training, we we won't talk any about it. 100% not. No, no way. And and that it's really unfair on doctors because they just, I, I mean, I mean, look, I don't need to tell you this. I'm preaching completely to convert it, but I don't think they know enough about dietetics or nutrition, sure, yeah. let alone yeah. the microbiome. Yeah. I think that is changing. Uh -huh. And I think, I think this fits into the broader revolution in kind of computational sciences, AI sciences. And I think the tools to interpret them are, are coming online. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a whole bunch of education that needs to happen. The other thing is, is I don't, it's not just that doctors are not taught about the microbiome or necessarily how to interpret a microbiome test. They're not taught how to use a microbiome test. So for me, a microbiome test, um, because the one thing that we've learned about microbiome science over the last 20 years is that your microbiome and my microbiome are completely different. They're like a fingerprint. Like at a species level, we might share 10% of the same species. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore making assumptions is quite difficult about the health of your microbiome versus the health of mine. And and so longitudinal analysis is really, really important. What you actually really want to do is se sequence your microbiome when you're healthy, mm. when you're well, because mm. then you kind of know what your baseline really should be. So yeah. when you get sick, actually you know what's changed and what should be there and what's, what, what shouldn't be there. And it's as much about that, right? So it might be like, as doctors, we are conditioned to think in a 19th century way about human biology. Like still, it doesn't, it just completely blows my mind. So we're taught to think like Louis Pasteur did mm. about germ theory, which is that all microbes are bad. So typically when you're looking at a test, you're saying, well, are there pathogens there that shouldn't be there? Your brain isn't going, what's missing? It's not going, hang on a minute, what have we lost here? And um, what mutualist should this patient be having in their gut or in their sample to promote health? And how do I sustain them and grow them back? Mm. Um, and 
and how do you do that over time? So to me, the microbiome is most useful. Uh, microbiome analysis is most useful in that capacity. Sometimes it's useful for detecting pathogens and bad actors, but most of the time it's about okay, how do I think about this patient's ecology, and how do I get their ecology back to a state where it's doing all of the things that that person needs for it to do to be well and to be happy. Yeah. So it, it, in my mind, there is. Uh, a role for mapping out what bugs are there, including you know viruses and nematodes yeah. and bacteria. But right now we're just talking about bacteria. But then also figuring out what the function of those are. So what the outputs are, what the metabolites are. Are there tests that actually demonstrate that end of the spectrum as well? Is that part of yeah. the test that you use currently? Or? So, so there are. Um, and they are slowly coming into the clinical domain, but we've been using them experimentally for a long okay. time. Mm -hmm. So So... Bugs produce small molecules, and we can measure those small molecules. We call those metabolites, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they also produce proteins, and we can measure those. So we can do that in a very targeted, quantitative way, and we can do that in a really species or strain-specific way. Um, but we can also measure the consequences of bugs interacting with the gut. That's much more difficult to do. So we sometimes, for example, would measure the epigenetics of that. So how bacteria change the expression of genes. Mm. Um, the problem with that is that many of those techniques are still experimental. In fact, I would argue that the majority of microbiome sequencing technologies haven't really been validated. They haven't been standardized. So we don't have any quality assurance that says, OK, if I'm using this test, I know that this test has been applied in a very robust and standard way and that I'm gonna get the same data every single time. Okay. And, and for these other tests, it's even less clear. So at the moment, there's a big debate about what are the optimum ways to measure the microbiome in, in routine clinical practice. Okay. And we're still quite a long way wow. from actually having it there in the way that we are, for example, with measuring the human genome. Sure. It's taken us a long time yeah. to get to a point where we can routinely perform human genetics. And we're about 10 years behind in the microbiome science, I think. So we've mm. still got a bit more to do. Just a quick one. If you're enjoying this kind of content, you will love our free newsletter called Seasonal Sundays. It goes into depth on a seasonal ingredient every Sunday. And we talk about the nutritional medicine benefits, the research and the culinary uses of an ingredient every Sunday with recipes included. You can get access to the free newsletter in the link just down below. With a focus on functional gut disorders and IBS, respectfully, that's a terrible name. Uh, and also respecting the fact that a lot of what you see is actually a result of unnecessary restriction from you know, misinformation online. What are some of the worst foods that you think people should be uh, cautious of in terms of how they may exacerbate uh, an underlying uh, disorder? I think to answer that question, you have to think about it in two ways. The first is, what foods do we think might cause the problem in the first place? Sure. And then what foods are going to exacerbate it or keep you in that cycle once you're there. Okay. Um, and that's an interesting question where there's a lot of debate, particularly around causation. So I think what we can quite comfortably say is a Western diet is really bad news for your gut and your gut mm -hmm. development. You might argue what a Western diet is, but broadly I conceptualize it as like a high animal fat, high um, animal protein, low plant-based fiber, low, um, you know, uh, um, well, low plant-based foods, but you, you would probably throw ultra-processed foods into that mix and you'd probably throw refined sugars into that mix. You'd probably, ref I'd actually throw alcohol into that mix. Mm. Um, and um, like we've known this for decades, right? We know that this is really bad. So in my research group, what we do is we are trying to study um, how that impacts gut function and gut evolution and gut development. And we've done some quite interesting, well, I think they're interesting, but I'm biased, right? Uh, we've done some studies looking at ethnic groups that are at very high risk for gut problems and those that are very low risk. So we looked at African-American males, and then we looked at sub-Saharan African rural uh, uh, people who have very high volumes of fiber in their diet, like 50 grams of fiber a day, almost no animal fat, almost no protein, animal protein. And then we crossed over their diets. And we just gave the Americans the African diet and the African the Americans diet. And we watched what happened. And the mm -hmm. transformation is astonishing. Mm. What's so interesting about the, 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 the transformation is it comes back to our previous discussion, is that the transformation is not necessarily in wholesale changes in the ecology of the gut, but 
um, dramatic changes in the functions of those microbes. They change. It's like night and day. Mm. Um, and the really good news about that is you can change your diet and you can have an impact very, very quickly within mm. two weeks. And it's completely uh, reciprocal, that change. What I'm interested in, though, is perhaps maybe we need to go even further back in time. So I think that many of these functional gut problems don't happen in adulthood. They're not caused in adulthood uh -huh. by eating, you know, fast food. I think what's happening is that actually it's the, it's it's right at the moment. I, I would actually argue it's the moment of conception. Okay. And I would argue that the key, that the maternal diet, whilst you're gestating, is is probably the most important nutritional and dietary driver of long-term gut functional changes. Wow, okay. I'm, I'm a radical on this, right? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, that's awesome. But certainly, <laughs> but certainly, if it's not the maternal diet, it's the diet that infants experience, certainly in the first three to five years of life. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And be, and the, my rationale for saying that is twofold. Number one is that the maternal microbiome, so the microbes inside the gestating mother's gut, they, the way I often describe it is they sing to the gestating infant, right? So we know that, um, oh God, this is really even more controversial, right? There's this theory that the gestating infant is sterile. Like uh -huh. there's no microbes in the gestating infant. Yeah. They can't cross the placenta, therefore it's sterile. Yeah. May not be, it turns out, but that's more controversial. But certainly what is happening is that the gestating mother's gut is producing lots and lots and lots of small molecules like metabolites that we were talking about. And those will happily get to the infant and they have a very important role in influencing organ development in that infant, uh -huh. right? And the development of that infant's immune system. Mm -hmm. And the really good example of that would be something called short chain fatty acids, mm -hmm. which are byproducts of plant fiber metabolism. So if mum has a westernized diet, the infant simply can't get the metabolites it needs to have normal organ development. And we know that changes their risk of obesity and chronic health diseases long term. Right? Mm -hmm. We know that from really not elegant studies. Uh -huh. But we also know that the gestating, the, the, the infant when they're born, they're born with a gut that's you know, more or less you know, sterile. There's not a lot of bugs in there. And it blooms, like it comes to life, like very, very quickly uh, through breastfeeding. Uh, and then as that infant explores the world, it becomes more sophisticated, more nuanced, it becomes richer, its diversity changes. And by about the age of five, it reaches an adult construct. Not necessarily a microbiome with an adult set of functions, but the ecology is kind of set, it's kind of locked in. Okay. And so what I'm saying to you is, is that if you, if that, if that, um, if that process is really badly damaged, either through nutrition or diet that's not effective or through other factors, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in a second, actually what happens is the gut is just not set up to cope. Okay. And that's why when I'm speaking to patients like we were talking about, I want to know what happened in those formative right. years. And more often than not, what you find is you'll say, I'll say to, I'll say to patients, hey, were you an earache kid? And they'll go, yeah, I was an earache kid. Or I had tonsillitis all of the time. And I was always taking that yellowy kind of medicine, you know, and, which is always the penicillin. And what you find is, is that in early life, they were just getting hammered with antibiotics. Yeah. And so what I think is much, you know, I know diet and nutrition is important. I don't want to take away from it. But actually what I'm really interested in is the destruction we do to our internal ecology in infancy and in early life and the long-term consequences for that, which mm. will be lifelong and which never get unpicked and which never get understood. Mm. And the problem if about not knowing it is that when you go to see a doctor, the doctor unknowingly will then just keep you in that cycle because they don't have any other solutions. Mm. And so they'll just keep giving you the antibiotics. They keep giving you the medicine which keeps causing damage to the microbiome, which just takes you further and further and further away. And then what happens is they end up in my clinic, desperate, yeah, going, I just don't know what to do anymore. And the strategy, the solution, is to think like a conservationist. Okay. It's to go, hang on, let's stop the cycle. And how do we grow back a lovely, luscious, green ecosystem like your lovely ruler, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. That has the functions that it needs. Yeah. You, you talked about this concept uh, of antibiotic scarring yeah. in the book as well. Yeah. Is this what you're referring to with these multiple insults yeah. to the, the gut? So there was a group in Washington that did a study that <clears throat> I find that really influenced me. And it was a study that they did looking at patients, healthy individuals, and they gave them a single dose of um, an antibiotic called azithromycin, which uh -huh. has got a strong antibiotic. 
Uh, and what they did was they then followed those patients over a period of about two years, looking at the impact on their microbiome. And then they compared those patients to um, some intensive care patients that have been really, really sick on massive doses of antibiotics. And what they found was is that <clears throat> some of those patients given azithromycin were very, very susceptible to damage. And in proportion, their microbiomes never grew back. So they just one dose of antibiotic, that was it. Their microbiome was forever changed. Wow. And um, in fact, it was so badly damaged, it resembled the microbiome of a patient that had been in intensive care. And it wasn't just that the kind of the rainforest of microbes was burnt to the ground. It was that what grew back just didn't have the same function. So it wasn't producing all of those same molecules that you need to sustain your health. And, and they referred to it as microbiome scarring. Mm. And so, that, so that's where I think about it. I think, imagine like a, a rainforest just being torched. It's that, that's how I conceptualize it. And what we know is that when you do that to the developing gut, and we know this again from very good longitudinal studies done in Finland and, in, and done in, in Scandinavia, and we know this from really good, very large-scale epidemiological studies. When you give antibiotics to infants, you fundamentally change their risk of obesity. You fundamentally change their risk of diabetes. You change their risk of um, inflammatory bowel disease. You change the risk of, actually, you change the risk of bowel cancer, right? You change the likelihood you're going to get polyps, which are precursor lesions in your bowel. And we also think it has a role in brain development, although that's a bit more controversial. And what we know is that the more antibiotics you have, and in the larger dose, the stronger that effect is. So if you've had antibiotics, you know, as a child, your risk of getting irritable bowel syndrome is three times that of someone who hasn't. Wow. It doesn't mean that nutrition and diet is still not important. Sure. It is important, but I'm increasingly of the opinion that the destruction that we create on our internal ecology through the misuse of antibiotics it might be more important. Mm. So to give you a sense of scale, like we prescribe 38 billion daily doses of antibiotics each year globally. 38 billion? Billion, right? Oh my gosh. Uh, like it's a lot. And, and, and the majority of those antibiotics are not actually being used in, in the West. They're used being, being used in China and India, where it's wow. just much easier to give yeah. the antibiotic than rather, you know, think about the consequences of it. And the majority of these antibiotics have been given to our kids. Mm. And um, what really troubles me about this is that we've known for a very long time with antibiotics. In fact, if you go back to the 1940s, when antibiotics were first really being widely used, which was at the end of the Second World War, the United Kingdom, well, the globe, the world, we, we had a starving population. We had, you know, food stamps. We couldn't feed our people. And the UK was in crisis, actually. But we had this new amazing medicine. And so what farmers did was they quite quickly started giving antibiotics to their animals because that was really good for husbandry because they were less likely to die, right? But they also noticed that they got fatter, quicker. And you could get a chicken to market weight, you know, in half or a third of the time. Mm. So what happened was is that antibiotics were then systematically misused, um, not by farmers, but they were missold by pharma, basically, mm. uh, and encouraged by governments because we had to feed a growing population. And um, the consequences of that are twofold. Number one is that 80% of all antibiotics today are actually used in farming and food production. So diet and nutrition is super important because the foods that we consume are grown largely thanks to antibiotics. And antibiotics are in our soil, they're in our oceans, they are everywhere, right? You can't, you can't escape them. So we'll talk about the soil microbiome, I'm sure, in a minute. Mm. But the, the other consequence, and what I'm arguing for, is that basically we're treating our children like battery chickens from the 1940s and wondering why they're obese. You trash the microbiome in early life, you inflame the gut, you promote insulin resistance, and then you just feed them a westernized diet, high in animal fats, low in fiber, and then we wonder why they're obese. Mm. Well, of course, you know. But unfortunately, it's not just obesity, it's all the other stuff that comes yeah. with it, right? Mm. Because of course, the microbiome is important in brain development. It's important in cardiovascular. It's just, it's linked to everything. Yeah. And, and therefore you've got a big old problem. Yeah. Or we have one anyway. Well, yeah, 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 it's a, yeah. It's a collective yeah. problem. Yeah. I, I, wanna, I wanna bring us back to, to the functional gut disorders. Yes. Because uh, we're all inherently lazy, right? Uh, yes, and I And I, I think people are probably listening to this and you've articulated 
so well a lot of what people are suffering with. Mm. They try loads of things online. They go to their GP. Mm. They go and see uh, uh, a number of different specialists for all the different uh, ailments that they have. And they end up in your clinic. Yeah. Just don't know what to do. And what you, what you talked about with regards to uh, figuring out what kind of childhood uh, issues mm. you had the courses of antibiotics where you were earache. Yeah. I was an earache kid. I was yeah. a tonsillitis kid. Yeah. You're speaking to me as well. Yeah. Um, stress, trauma, etc. Is there an 80-20 here? What, is there uh, uh, an, uh, an area where you're like, okay, 80% of the issues I think are down to this and it doesn't necessarily need to be diet. It could be stress. It could be trauma, whatever. But is there an 80-20 rule there or is it literally an, uh, on an individual basis, everyone's got completely unique backgrounds that lead to those yeah. functional issues. So so I think what I what I've definitely begun to do, the word I would use, the kind of medical jargon word I would use is phenotype. So okay. what I've begun to do <laughs> yeah. is like I can now, if you like, put these patients into specific groups. Uh -huh. Right. Do you want to explain what yeah, a phenotype is? I will is, do. So, yeah. <laughs> so so a phenotype means like the physical manifestation of a of a of a of, of a gene, right? So I've got brown eyes because my genes program me to have brown eyes, right? So what I mean by that is that um, when someone comes into my room, usually I have to spend quite a lot of time listening. Like the first trick, if any doctor's listening to this, is just really, really listen. And uh, you've really got to listen. You've got to give people enough time to really talk because a lot of the things that we've just described are actually really hard to talk about. And sometimes it takes more than one visit. Mm. It takes two or three visits. And I think a lot of the people that come to see me are really damaged. They're really mistrusting of medical professionals. They've been told a million different things. It's not what, and they're just in agony. And, um, and so it takes time to build trust. And the only way you can do that is through listening. Um, and you've got to give room people to talk freely. So that I think is a really key piece of advice. That, so, so when it comes to that, and you've been through that listening process, I think you can really group them into gut brain people. So people who have had some problem in the way that the brain and the gut have developed, and that might be because um, it was something in the gut that triggered the brain, or it might be something in the brain that triggered the gut. It's a two-way thing, right? But there's definitely a gut brain people. There's definitely a post-infective people. So there's definitely people that went, I went on holiday to Thailand, I had a dodgy curry, and now my world has fallen apart. And I've been like this for you know a year and I don't know what to do. That's a post-infective kind of thing. And that's a wholly different thing. Mm -hmm. There's definitely, this is gonna be even, this is gonna be really controversial, right? But there's definitely a public school thing. Oh, really? For sure. Okay. There's, there's a boarding school thing. Wow. Okay. I'm, honestly. Let's like, go into it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I just, I really think it. Like, and I'm a product of it, right? So, but like, there's definitely something in kids that were in, <laughs> that were in boarding school, which I, is super, super interesting to me. And, and I think it's a combination of two things. I think it's partly psychology and, and, and partly, um, you know, uh, biology. Uh -huh. Um, I think there's definitely a group of kids who, um, sorry, a group of kids that kind of really struggle in that environment. And um, they probably have it. It's probably in the gut brain group, really. Okay. But but I've really noticed that. Um, there's definitely a group of people that have nutritional and dietary triggers that, um, you know, probably do have genuine food intolerances and very, very rarely f proper food allergies. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I think lots of people are now are very, very um, aware of food intolerances and they will sit down and they will say to me, I've got a food intolerance. And I'm like, do you really? And they're like, yes, I do. And and they will know what they've got. Um, sometimes it is and sometimes, sometimes it isn't. So that's certainly how I think about it. I think about gut brain, post-infective, nutrition and diet. And then I've also got like an other box. Okay. And the other box is like, what am I missing here? Yeah. That's like my clinical like brain going, uh, am I missing like proper organic pathology, like what I would call like diseases, like diseases that I can diagnose and I need to know about and I need to treat with the medicine. Sure. So my process is to rule those out, make uh -huh. sure we're not missing anything, make sure everyone is comfortable and we're not, we can have a conversation about function and then to break it down. Sure. The public school thing I think is very interesting. Yeah. Do you think there's some trauma in that? You know, the- hundred percent. Yeah. And I think if you, um, I think if you kind of, there's been lots of quite good books written about this recently. And I think there's a whole branch of psychotherapy purely devoted to it. Right. And, and I think it is trauma. Uh -huh. I really do. Uh -huh. And I think, um, but I think it's also learned behaviors. I think when you're in an institution and 
your gut and gut function mm. becomes regulated by the institution. Mm. And trying to unpick that is super, super wow. challenging. I also think nutrition and diet plays a big role. Yeah. Like, you know, your, 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 the foods that you eat are kind of become very homogenized and very consistent. And then of course, I, you know, I listen, I'm a microbiome scientist for me at all. When I mean, you've got a hammer, everything's a nail, right? But yeah. um, <laughs> I, I think, well, we absolutely know when you go into institutions, yeah. particularly at, um, in, in, in early life that those microbiomes homogenize, they, wow. they align. Yeah, yeah. Like, and that happens in care homes, it happens in prisons, yeah. it happens in offices, right? And I think in schools, that's super important. I think one of the reasons it's really, really important is puberty. So, so um, bugs in the gut have a very important role in defining how hormones work, particularly sex hormones. So testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, for example. Uh, and there seems to be quite an important interaction between bugs and these hormones and gut function, mm -hmm. right? Which is part of the reason why we were talking earlier about like periods and stuff, yeah. why it's so important in, in influencing bloating and these symptoms in women who have that, um, that, that particular set of symptoms around the time of their period. But it's also the same in boys. Testosterone is really, really important in, in, in regulating gut function and bugs sort of sit in between that. Now, what's interesting is that, or at least what's interesting to me is that um, that relationship seems to get locked in around puberty when you get these big hormone surges. And once that gut function is locked in at puberty, it's very difficult to unpick it. Um, and quite often patients will say, yeah, I was absolutely fine and then puberty kicked in. Or they will say, I was really suffering and then puberty happened and actually things got a bit better. Mm. Um, and it seems that that kind of time frame is very, very important. So I think if you're, in, if you're in a school environment where those biological pathways are getting locked in uh, and they're not locked in correctly, that's problematic long term, mm. I think. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of uh, points around animal fats and yeah. uh, plant-based diets. Do you think meat and animal-based products are necessary for health or can we do without them completely? Well, we're going to have to do without them because <laughs> if we keep going like we're going, we're in real trouble. Yeah. Right? I mean, it kind of blows my mind. Like, I mean, I have to say... When I was a surgical trainee, like even as a kind of you know, I was just, I really thought everything could be healed with a knife. Like I really did. I was that awful cliche. And I thought nutrition and diet was ridiculous. And I thought that, um, you know, just have a hamburger for Christ's sake. So that's, and, and I can't tell you how, how radically my position has changed. Like the, our, we are addicted to meat. We eat 3 million chickens a day in the UK. There's a billion farm animals or animals purely devoted to our consumption in the United Kingdom for 60 million people. And it's, it's, un, it's completely unsustainable. And one of the reasons that I believe it's unsustainable is to keep that livestock alive, you need a lot of antibiotics, mm. right? And that's really problematic. So we have got to reduce our dependence on it. We have to, for a million different reasons, for planetary health, right? Mm. Mm. And if you assume that many of our problems as I do are effectively because of an internal climate crisis. The only way to solve that is by fixing the planetary climate crisis. They're intimately connected. Do I believe that you've got to be a vegan to be healthy? No, I don't, you don't. And um, you can happily eat a little bit of white meat or chicken or fish uh, every so often and, and you'll be fine, you'll be just healthy. You know, mm -hmm. have a steak every so often. I don't think it's gonna cause you to be unhealthy. But I think it's all about context and it's all about balance and it's all about actually um, the foods that you consume with it and the relative proportions that you have of plant-based foods. And I'm increasingly of the opinion as well that nutrition and dietary health is as much about how you cook it, who you eat it with, and you know where those foods actually come from, right? Some of that's kind of obvious. I know that you know that. Um, but I think one of the biggest sort of challenges that we have in society at the moment is really loneliness, mm. right? The, the, we're digitally isolated, family unit size is decreasing. We live in urban environments that are disconnected. Like we live on top of each other, but we're actually disconnected. And um, real world social networks are very, very important ways for sharing microbes and for maintaining the diversity of your microbiome, right? 
big big networks of teenagers have more diverse microbiomes. Big family units have more diverse microbiomes. You know, cultures that really work together and, and have a community have a more diverse microbiome. And food and eating is an important way to bring people together and to make that happen. But also if you're f cooking food with your hands, you know, that's really good for your, for your, for your, for your ecology. And we've done studies, again, looking at, um, again, like uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africans and how they prepare and cook food because all of the soil microbiomes are on their fingers and yeah. it goes into their food, right? Uh, uh, westernized people, you know, we have staffs and streps and we have no diversity on our fingers whatsoever. Um, I think food delivery apps are carcinogenic <laughs> and should be, should be banned. Okay, yeah. Like I feel really strongly about them. I just think they are, they are I think they're incredibly bad for us. Um, because they take us away from all of the things I've just described to you. It, it, we, we give up our own agency to have control of the foods that we eat, to know where our food is coming from, to prepare our food, to eat with other people, and to take ownership of the problem. And if you read the Uber Eats reports, which I'm sure you probably do, <laughs> I find them inherently depressing yeah. <laughs> because we are just leveraging you know, socially addictive, digitally addictive practices to perpetuate an unhealthy food cycle that takes us further and further and further away from where we really need to be. And and so, you know, I think, I think that, yeah, you don't have to eat meat, you know, to be, uh, sorry, you know, I think, I think you can eat meat. I don't think eating meat per se is a problem, but I think we've got sort of bigger problems rather than just meat consumption. <laughs> Uh, I'm really interested in how you navigate this with um, two teenagers. Yeah, so you've got a 13 year old and a 15 year old. You know, one's getting into yeah. weight training and stuff. And you, you know, you used to be of the opinion of you know nutrition's yeah. not. And I'm sure they're probably learning, and they're probably not listening to you because you know you're <laughs> yeah. their dad. They're definitely not listening. <laughs> yeah. To yeah. So I, I'm wondering how you instill this in the in the next generation because they're going to take up the, uh, the the position that we're in, right? Sure. And they're probably they probably think Uber Eats and, and Deliver and everything is like the best thing ever. The fact that they can be yeah. in a park and then then get a hamburger right there and you walk yeah. anywhere. So it's yeah. so uh, um, I've written about my kids and, you know, because they obviously um, my kids actually they really inform my worldview now because okay. I see the world through their eyes and I, I really want to understand how they perceive the world. But like it used to drive me nuts when my son was about eight. Like he just wouldn't just would not like have a very diet and it's like i'm the same as any other parent you're trying to get your kids to have a plant based diet is basically impossible when they are just you know exposed to all these really super delicious fast foods all of the time so like you know i certainly don't have that whole bit now but i think what's so interesting is that actually my son now particularly and my daughter actually in fact and especially my daughter their attitude to foods now as teenagers is, in fact, incredibly progressive and really, really good. They worry very much about what, they, what they're what they eating and having control over it. Uh, and, um, and in fact, like, probably they've probably gone the other way, actually. Okay. Um, and, and I think there's a happy medium and balance to be got there because what you don't really want is your kids... Uh, uh, becoming anxious and stressing and worrying too much about every single last micronutrient yeah. in the food that they're eating. Uh, and I don't want my kids worrying about supplementing their food with, you know, these sorts of additional agents. What you want, what I want for them is to have a diverse, balanced diet. But but actually, no, they're pretty progressive now and they're pretty good. And, and actually, I feel quite optimistic about young people more broadly. I think young people are much more equipped to deal with it than perhaps my generation. And I see that in lots of different, you know, fields, whether it's kind of climate change in the United Kingdom or globally or whether it's gun control in the US, whatever. Like I, I feel like on the big socio-political issues of the uh -huh. of our time, yeah. I think young yeah, I feel optimistic about young people. Yeah. For, from um from food to no food, uh let's talk a bit about fasting. Because okay. fasting has become very popular uh -huh. as it uh, as people have seen, you know, the benefits to their gut, to their mm -hmm. gut symptoms. You know, a lot of anecdotal evidence is there and and, and actual studies looking at improvements uh, mm. in weight and other parameters mm. by adopting different fasting regimens uh, whether it be alternate day fasting 5-2 yeah uh, time restricted feeding what what are your thoughts on fasting what do you what does it actually do to the gut when when someone fasts so i think f fasting diets is probably the one nutritional dietary intervention where there's quite good evidence that actually it has sustained health benefits 
on everything from longevity through to you know d d d decreasing risk actually of immune mediated and often inflammatory conditions. So I think it's quite a good thing. I actually sometimes you know fast myself, and and rarely I will recommend intermittent fasting to my patients under controlled and specific conditions. Okay. Um, and what we know is that when you fast, certainly from a microbiome perspective, what you have is a um, uh, quite a rapid and extreme cull of bacteria in your system. Because of course, when you eat and you eat a meal, you're feeding your microbes. You're not just feeding you, you're sustaining and feeding the trillions of bacteria uh, that live within your gut and they all live in a connected system. So when you fast, you'll have a dramatic sort of 10,000 fold plus decline in the bacteria within your gut. Mm -hmm. um, and that will also happen, you know, it'll happen the entire way through the gut from your mouth down to your bottom. Mm -hmm. And that is sometimes quite a good thing, uh, particularly if your microbiome is not in a particularly healthy state to start with. Um, and it will, part of the mechanisms through which it will be anti-inflammatory and that it will influence the immunology of the gut is because of that function. Like you're just reducing the microbial burden in the gut, you're changing the ecology of the little gut and it, it will have an effect. We know many of the mechanisms or at least some of the mechanisms through which intermittent fasting works and we know that it changes immune programming in the cells of the gut we know that it changes program cell death in the gut uh, and we know that that has a systemic effect on on the body but i think the role of the microbiome is really just being understood i think it's not really well defined okay. uh, at all okay i think what's interesting about intermittent fasting though is that if you look at some studies particularly in the treatment of cancer uh -huh. that actually intermittent fasting uh, might have a therapeutic role in very specific circumstances so this is not a generic panacea sure. like if you're listening to this and you're you know receiving treatment for any disease please speak to your doctor and, and don't necessarily just do this but but what we know in trials is that intermittent fasting seems to change the efficacy, so how effective some medicines are in the treatment of cancer. And it seems to influence um, also the side effects of those medicines. Mm -hmm. And one of our hypotheses for why this works is because you're changing the bugs in the gut and it's the bugs that change how those, how those, how those medicines work and how effective they are. But it might also be that you're starving cancer cells, you're changing uh -huh. the metabolism of cancer cells uh -huh. uh, or changing the, some of those other immune processes like those programmed cell death uh, cycles that I was telling you about. So I think what we're seeing is that intermittent fasting is now slowly being considered as a therapy mm. and diet and nutrition is slowly being considered as a, as a therapy because we are beginning to understand diet, bug, disease interactions. So, so, so medicine, food as medicine is, I think, becoming more of a reality or lack of food as medicine. Lack of food as yeah. medicine. Yeah. Is in lack of the foods that are medicine in one's diet. Sorry, is it? Is, that, is, it, it, uh, the, uh, is it the lack of certain foods that are medicinal that's uh, in one diet? I, we, we're eating food, but not the, the right kind of food. Yeah, we are, we're not. And, like, and we were talking about this before, before we entered this conversation. Like I find walking around my hospital, um, once you're switched onto this and the blinkers are off and you and you and you understand that diet is such an important determinant of um, therapy, the success of therapy for, mm. for for medical and surgical treatments, when you walk around a hospital, it's kind of depressing. Yeah. Like I, I my dietetic colleagues are amazing. Like it's not their fault. Like they're doing extremely good work under incredibly difficult circumstances. The chefs in our kitchens have no budget to deal with. Sure. Like they've got nothing to cook with and, and everyone's doing their best. So mm. it's not, I'm not being critical of the people of the system, but when you're walking around a hospital and you're seeing packets of sweets and Lucozades mm. and sugars, and you just know that also patients aren't being able to get the type of nutrition in the way that they need it, mm. it you think, oh gosh, we're really missing an opportunity here. Yeah, and I think also there's an, a, a growing industry around uh, healthy foods or like health halo foods where they are probably just as detrimental as the ultra processed foods that they're trying to replace Correct. whether it's like you know uh crisps versus healthy crisps is there any such thing as a healthy crisp but i don't think so if you look at the ingredients so. they're pretty much the yeah. same you know, <laughs> yes. whether one's baked yeah. or, or 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 deep fried it's probably yeah. neither there you know um and so I, I think there's there's probably two sides of the problem because what I'm I'm noticing now in hospitals is that they've they've put these like 
healthy vending machines in. And yes. It's just like, you know, overpriced yes. rubbish, in, in my opinion. I, it's yeah. kind of controversial to talk about that, but like, I, I just don't think it's it's uh, solving the, the underlying issue. No, it absolutely isn't. I've dined at those vending machines. Oh, have you? <laughs> in the middle of the night. Um, I mean, what other yeah. option do you have? Yeah. I mean. Well, yeah, but you joke, but like, we, you, you're completely right. Like, we don't really provide our staff with the nutritional requirements they need sure. to be healthy in the workplace. Sure. And if you can't set the standard, then, then it's very difficult to get the trickle down that you were talking about before. But I think, and just to follow on from that point, which I think is I've also really noticed in my practice, is that patients will come and see me and they will literally have bags of supplements, bags of probiotics, bags of prebiotic, bags of things. And, and they have lost perspective and they, have, they just can't see the wood from the trees. And the problem is the supplements. Mm. I spend a lot of my time taking people off supplements, mm. taking people off probiotic therapies. I like probiotics, I use them. I'm not saying that there is not a place for these things. I'm just saying that they are not a panacea. Yeah. Like if you've got bad gut function, drowning yourself in supplements is very unlikely to solve your problem. Yeah. And actually what you need to do is to give that kind of forest of microbes in your gut some breathing space and some room to heal and some room to recover. And quite often what that means is having a, uh, a diverse and properly balanced diet uh, and, and getting to that point with a, with a professional who really knows what they're talking about. And that means a dietitian mm. who can work with you in a supportive and structured way to get you there. Mm -hmm. and, and quite often that might mean going through a period of restriction and taking out bits of food from your diet, but often it means doing that in a way that we can then reintroduce them. Yeah. Um, because you shouldn't have to live your life, you know, um, uh, on a very restricted diet. Like, I don't believe that that's a good outcome for anybody, really. Yeah. I want to talk about probiotics. Oh, yeah. Because sure. when you wrote the book, was it, was it 18 months ago? You wrote yeah, when about it came that, out? Yeah. So, in the book, you, you wrote uh, there were 30,000 papers on probiotics at that point. It's yeah. probably more than that now. Yeah. Uh, considering it's been a little while since the book mm. was published. Um, probiotics are everywhere. I get yeah. asked about these daily, if not week, you know, every other day. Um, how do people determine, A, whether probiotics are appropriate for them, and B, what probiotics would be beneficial, if any, that are available? I think there's a short answer to that, which is that they don't. Okay. And what they do is they make it up and they have a go. Okay. And I think consumers do that. I think doctors do that. I think nurses do that. And and um, we are incredibly bad at targeting specific strains to specific healthcare problems. We're very bad at that for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, the evidence base for probiotics, although we've got lots and lots of papers on it, and lots and lots of studies, I should say, the evidence base is not very robust. It's not mm -hmm. very good. And a lot of those studies are not very good quality studies. And a major problem with those studies is that quite often they don't give us mechanism. They don't explain how a particular strain has a particular health benefit. Okay. Part of the reason for that is really hard to do. It's really expensive to do uh, and it takes a lot of time. And the consequence of that is that the regulators in EU and in the US have said that you can't make health claims about probiotics. Okay. So what happens is, is that they say, okay, we'll, we'll make wellness claims. Um, and they create a marketing language around that, which is good and bad bacteria. There's no such thing as good and bad bacteria. That is marketing nonsense. There's pathogens that cause disease, and there's mutualists. And if you treat your mutualists badly enough, they'll cause you harm, mm. right? So if you take enough probiotic of anything, it will cause you harm. Okay. Um, so what happens is you've got a marketing speech, you've got a wellness industry, and you've got a slightly overwhelmed consumer and a doctor doesn't really know what to do because they can't they can't sift through the evidence base to work out what is what is effective and what is not. The second problem is that no one really understands how to take probiotics properly, right? So to take a probiotic, what you have to understand is you're taking a living organism, and that living organism needs to be fed, and it needs to live in a niche where it can grow uh, and that means that you've got to take a probiotic sustainably. So if you're going to take a probiotic, you need to take it every day, uh -huh. and you need to take it every day for at least eight to 12 weeks, usually, depending on the problem you're trying to fix. Uh -huh. And um, you've got to think about your nutrition and your diet around it, otherwise it's not going to have the benefits. So if you're having a probiotic and you're you know, knocking it back with some steak and chips, <laughs> right? there's just no point, right? So it's, there's got to be like a, a, you know. 
And the, the other thing that I would say is, is that, um, you, you know, they're, they're, if those probiotics make you feel unwell, stop taking the probiotic, right? If you're bloating, you're having diarrhea, it's not going to make you feel any better. Stop it, mm. right? And you'd be amazed about how many patients I see and they're like, I've just had this awful bloating since I've been taking this brand. I'm like, well, just stop. Just know, stop it's not, you know. <laughs> but but the, the other thing is, is that, um, that I think um, there is evidence for probiotics. So before, I, I don't want to be too negative about this because actually there are some really good randomized controlled trials and there are some good studies and I do use them. Okay. So I will use them in my, in my clinical practice and I use them in a really controlled way and I will use them in an evidence-based way. Um, and... Um, uh, you know, we try and use probiotic strains that have a good dosing effect that we know get to the organ that we're really interested in, for example. Um, but also I try and measure it. So we were talking about measuring the microbiome. Yeah. So I'm increasingly trying to do that in a targeted way. Okay. So if you know which very specific strains are missing, yeah. you can say, well, okay, I really think you need to have these strains. Okay. Um, but you've got to be able to get to strain level. You've got to be able to get to species level. And most direct-to-consumer microbiome tests don't let you do that, which is why it's a problem. Um, and the other thing that I would say is, is that what you're seeing is an evolution of probiotic uh, technology. So at the moment, probiotics are foods. They're not, they're not medicinal products. So your doctor isn't prescribing them for you. And mm -hmm. that's why they're sold in, you know, Tesco's and Lidl yeah. and whatever, right? Yeah. Um, but that's changing. So what we're beginning to understand now from microbiome science over the last 20 years is that actually there are specific strains of bacteria that are human probiotic strains that we are identifying from studies of diseases where we know that either if they're missing, that disease is more likely to be prevalent, mm. uh, or if they're missing, you're more likely to have gut injury or gut harm, right? So a really good example of that would be Acomantia mucinophilia, mm -hmm. right? So this is what we would call a next generation probiotic, which has come through scientific research in humans. And you're now starting to see these next generation of probiotics come onto the market and they're being sold in a very different way. And this is going to be extended into engineered probiotic strains, where we're actually, we're genetically engineering these bacteria to have very specific functions that deliver very specific mechanisms. And these next generation probiotics will not be foodstuffs. They will be regulated by the FDA and in the UK by the MHRA in a very, very different way. Okay. And they will be prescribed. Okay. And they will have a very different set of criteria around them. So I think probiotic... Um, science is changing. It's really, really changing very, very dramatically. You're also starting to see probiotics being now manufactured that have lots of other small molecules in that probiotic formula. So for example, you'll see probiotics manufactured with uh, a molecule called butyrate, mm -hmm. which is a short chain fatty yeah. acid because we know that they like to eat a bit of butyrate mm -hmm. and it also has a secondary belt. Uh, okay. uh, so pr the probiotic kind of industry is, is changing. It's getting smarter, it's getting wiser. It does want to make health claims. The quality of the trials are getting better. It's becoming more selective. It's becoming more targeted. Okay. But I think for the consumer, it's still really difficult to navigate. Oh, it's through. super confusing because I think as a proxy for not being able to make specific claims around yeah. probiotics uh, what i've definitely seen in the consumer industry is well our probiotic reaches the large intestine live yes uh, and, and uh, we've got studies to show that i was like okay that's that that's great you'd want that as a minimum but what about the strain and, yeah. and whether that's relevant so to what me? yeah yeah so what it's a so what question. it's so yeah. what right exactly right and so unless you're unless you're having a what I would call like a patient benefit, unless you're experiencing an improvement in your symptoms and that's validated at the very, very least, or that you can understand the mechanisms through which those particular strains are having that effect. It's a kind of a so what. Yeah. Um, and actually what I found that's really interesting, this is completely anecdotal. I need to publish this data, but now that I've started like prospectively and longitudinally sequencing the microbiome, uh -huh. uh, what you see is that quite often these microbes just don't engraft in the gut. So they will be guzzling lactobacilli mm. and it just, doesn't translate. It just mm. doesn't hit. The, it doesn't hit the gut. So it's not even having an effect. And then the question has to be: Well, why not? Like, why is it not engrafting? Why is the condition of the gut so hostile that it just can't engraft? Is it a problem in the gut itself? Is it a problem in the ecology of the gut? Is there something else competing? And then you've got to kind of work out that 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 puzzle. 
The other problem that I see, I see the exact opposite. I saw this literally in clinic this week, like this patient coming to see me with recurrent urinary tract infections, you know, no one can work out why. We, se we sequenced their microbiome. And the reason is, is that their gut was almost exclusively dominated by Bifidobacterium longum, which is a probiotic strain that this person had been consuming in the hope that they were gonna make their gut better. And what they'd actually done was make their gut much, much worse because their gut was, you know, probably about 80%, you know, biffs. And, and that's not what you need. What you need mm. is a lovely ecosystem full of lots of different types of microbes that has the diversity it needs to outcompete bad bugs and to maintain the health of the gut. So when you really start measuring it and you really start looking into it, what you can do is you can begin to give much more targeted and focused guidance and you can start to make much more inf informed decisions about probiotic as a, as a kind of medicinal therapy. But like, if you come and see me, and I'm gonna, you're gonna, I'm gonna, for whatever reason, I've got to give you antibiotics. You're gonna get a probiotic. Okay. If you've got traveler's diarrhea, you're gonna get a probiotic. Okay. If you've got C diff, you're gonna get a probiotic. Uh -huh. If you're an infant with colic, you're gonna get a probiotic. Like there are re there are things with really good evidence base where actually, you know, you should be you should be taking it. What are the are there individual strains of those different uh, 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 individual place uh, clinical scenarios that you just mentioned? So quite often that's difficult because the probiotics are not usually given as individual strains. So they'll typically have a lactobacilli strain with it. They'll typically you have a bif a bifidobacteria strain you might have a saccharomyces boulardia which is like a it's, a it's a yeast it's not a bacteria sure. and and usually it's a kind of a combination so usually it's the it's the product that was trialed in that particular instance that, that you give which is usually a combination of okay. those of those things it's rare that you get single strains uh -huh. what we are starting to see though again i'm sure this will be interesting to you is that um because we're beginning to understand the nuance and things like the gut and the brain and how they work, we are starting to see next generation probiotics come on to the market that are what we call psychobiotics. Mm. So but probiotics that are particularly targeting gut-brain interactions. And again, most of the time, these are probiotic strains that are not based on human data. So usually they're based on animal experiments or animal data where these probiotics have been put into animals and then they don't really necessarily translate into humans. So I think although it's a very exciting area of advance in probiotics, I think at the moment, it, I can't say to you with any degree of confidence, yeah, take the strain, you're not going to be as depressed as you were before. I don't think it's that simple at the moment. Yeah. I can't remember whether you spoke about this in your book, but there was a recent paper whereby they gave uh, probiotics alongside antibiotics or either after mm. antibiotic course, and they found that it took longer in the probiotic cohort for those folks to get back to their normal uh, microbiome states. I'm not too sure yeah. we came across that before. No, I don't think I've seen that. Is that a, an argument against taking the probiotic uh, after having a course of antibiotics? That you can't get to your normal state of your microbiome? Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure it is. I think um, to try and give you a sense of scale, like mm. I'm, I want to try and explain perhaps like the, the challenges of what we're talking about. So you've got probably we don't know for sure but about a hundred trillion bacteria in your gut like it's a lot it's a mind-boggling it's so large i can't even really conceive of it so when you're taking a billion colony forming units which mm. seems like a lot mm. it's a teeny tiny drop in the ocean and so you know what you've got is a super sophisticated ecosystem and you're dropping in a tiny amount of a handful of strains, where there should be a thousand or 500 strains, you're giving five or six. Mm. So this idea that a probiotic is gonna reconstitute the whole ecology of the gut mm. is ridiculous, of course it doesn't. In fact, it makes almost no difference to it whatsoever. So it may be though that what those microbes are doing is regulating, uh, they're perhaps either competing or out-competing particular pathogens that might profit from a change in the ecosystem driven okay. by an antibiotic, mm. or what they're doing is they're having a direct effect on the gut to stop you from getting diarrhea or having some other effect. So although you're not necessarily seeing a change in the ecology over time, it might be that actually there is nonetheless a beneficial, a benefit. beneficial effect, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, sometimes, and I don't know if you were gonna talk about this or not, but sometimes like you, it's not enough. Like you can't make the changes that you need with one, two, three, five, six, 10, 20 strains. Sometimes what you need is 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 a wholesale ecosystem change, sure. right? Right. So that's where you have to do a fecal transplant because yeah. it's just not enough. So if patients are really sick, actually you've just got to take the whole the whole ecosystem and change it over. Are you experimenting or aware of any folks who are looking at fecal microbial transplants in a non sort of acute setting, i.e. not 
outside of the realm of C yeah, infection? Absolutely. So there's about 400 randomized controlled trials of FMT worldwide at the moment, a bit wow. more than that, actually, wow. in a plethora, like a large number of chronic disease states, okay. right? So everything from um, I would think the things you would expect, like clost Clostridium difficile infection, but through to um, addiction, depression, anxiety, autism. Oh, uh, I should say, when we say fecal micro microbial transplants, we're talking about poop transplants. Yeah, it's as gross yeah. as you think. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, yeah. It is exactly that. So, yeah. so you probably, you may be interested, but I don't know. It, 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 effectively, what you do is you treat the, it's a donation process. And it, much like you would have any other organ donor, there is a you know a safety process that goes through it so and uh you will take a donor and you will screen them to make sure they don't have any diseases and or any pathogens that could be transfected or carried into the recipient uh, and there's a minimal amount of processing that goes in sometimes you mix it with a bit of saline sometimes that gets through a nasogastric tube into the stomach sometimes it's given as an enema and increasingly we try and give it as what is affectionately known as a crapsule, crapsule right yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is basically freeze-dried poo in a capsule yeah. which yeah. you which you eat and you dissolve uh, and um, when you give it in specific circumstances like, you know, infections in the gut, it's transformative. Like it mm -hmm. just works immediately and it's very, very satisfying to watch. And the other thing about uh, fecal microbiota transplant is that it's been used as a tool for studying the microbiome for many, many years because it's a very interesting way to understand how microbes change human biology and the mechanism of disease. And... Um, because of that, that's translated into FMTs in lots of the conditions that I was telling you about. Sure. So in the kind of early 2000s, there was a group in Washington that, that, that published a study that showed that you can take feces from twins who are genetically identical, where one is obese and one is lean. And if you take the feces from the obese twin and you put it into a mouse that's lean, the mouse will, will become obese. Mm. And then you can make that mouse lean again by taking the feces from the lean twin and transfecting it. And we've seen that same experimental model used countless times. Mm. So it works in autism spectrum condition, for example. Oh, it really? works in, yeah, like it's totally, totally mad, isn't it? Like you can, you can take a, you can take a, twins who are genetically identical where one has uh, autistic spectrum condition and the other doesn't and you transfect the feces from the autistic twin into a mouse model and that mouse will develop autistic behaviors gosh what's interesting about that is that it doesn't develop all of the same behaviors because those behaviors are programmed some by genes and some by environment some by microbes so it's a nuanced thing mm. what i think is really important from those experiments is that that effect only occurs until weaning okay so once the animal is weaned, the effect stops. Ah. And that comes back down to the conversation we were having earlier. Like the programming that happens to the gut through microbes in early life for things like brain development is like you've got a finite window where you can make that change, where oh. things have kind of, you can really make an impact. And, it, and it's very, very important. But nonetheless, we see, you know, for that reason, we see FMT trials in, in autism and, and OCD and ADHD. There's lots of kind of interesting work going on, peanut allergies, all this sort of work. Um, yeah, very, very diverse field. Yeah. Is there anything that's positive in those human trials looking at ASD? There's lots positive. And... But I think you have to take that positivity in context, sure. right? Yeah. So, so I think largely those trials are being done because we want to benefit the patients, obviously. We want to benefit people that have those conditions, but quite often it's trying to understand mechanism. Mm. And um, it's also not a panacea, right? This is not a panacea that's going yeah. to solve all of our problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sometimes the effect size is quite nuanced or quite small. Sometimes it's a bit of data that gets us a little bit further to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning is, of course, that when you give a fecal transplantation, actually, you've got to match the donor to the recipient, right? And actually, that turns out it's really quite hard to do. And in the same way that we were talking about engrafting bugs with probiotics, you've got to do the same thing. Those yeah. bugs have got to grow yeah. and you've got to feed them. So, uh, and, and so at the moment, it's quite a blunt tool mm -hmm. and we're getting much, much better at targeting it in a really effective way. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, of course, FMT is probably not the end goal here. Like we probably don't want to be doing FMT. It's pretty gross, it's pretty <laughs> expensive. You know, who really wants that? What you really want to be doing is saying, okay, what is the community that you need? And can you synthesize and grow that community? Uh, you know, and then can we just do that in a really scalable, you know, sustainable way? Mm. And I think that's probably where we're going. Yeah. Um, 
I want to talk about the Easter Balloon. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned uh, psychobiotics earlier, and I yeah. think this this area of women's health and, and the interaction between gut microbes and hormones more generally is fascinating. Perhaps we can talk about what the Easter Balloon sure. is and, and how that might change over time. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I'll, so I'll explain what it is before we, before we do that. I'll, I'll, I'm going to come back a little bit because we were sure. talking about IBS. Oh, yes. So, yeah, so, yeah. so what I think, no, but I'll, I'll explain why. So I what's interesting to me is that there are quite, significant sex differences in uh, what we call IBS between men and women. And women tend to be more constipated and they also tend to have more chronic pain. Uh -huh. They tend to get more pain in the pelvis and they will have other kind of symptoms that, that go with it. I'm not saying men don't get these things or men don't have chronic pain, it's just more prevalent in women. And one of the mm -hmm. hypotheses for this is that there is a bug androgen interaction, right? So these bugs and the hormones that that, that, that we produce as, um, as different genders or sexes seems to be quite important in determining that risk and those symptoms. And so um, we are therefore interested in um, how microbes modify hormones and also how hormones modify microbes. And it turns out that's really, really important and it's really, really complicated. And the word that has been coined for that is the estrobolone, which mm. is estrogen, obviously. So mm. what are the kind of broader systems effects of, of estrogen? Now, what's, what's important to understand with that is that in keeping with our conversation, that, that, that the estrobolone has an effect on gender associated health or sex associated health from you know conception all the way through to, to death right and it might be that it's the setup that's really 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 important and if you perturb one or the other because it's an access mm -hmm. an access sorry then um the consequences might be quite long lasting and we're beginning to understand how that happens okay yeah. so I'll, I'll i'll talk a little bit of science but i'll try and keep it you know simple so the, w the way that I think about it is that your nervous system has its own immune defense system. So all nerves have their own little cells, part of something called the innate immune system, mm -hmm. whose job is just to defend the nervous system, but also to kind of prune it, make sure the nerves don't get out of hand, mm -hmm. keep it all in check, right? Those cells are called, they're called microglial cells. Mm -hmm. And you have them in the gut and you have them in the brain. You have macroglial cells, but we won't go into that. Anyway, it turns out that the, the, how those microglial cells evolve and function is very, very dependent on, um, uh, they, they, there are sex dependent changes on how they, on how they develop. Mm -hmm. And they develop very differently in men and women. And if you perturb them with antibiotics, the consequences are very, very long standing. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be that you can influence a risk of chronic pain, certainly in animal models, and we seem to see similar data in human data. So you can influence chronic pain risk uh, by, uh, giving antibiotics to these animals through the changes in those microglial cells because microbes sit between them. So there's like a, there's a uh, hormone, bacteria, microglial kind of axis. Okay. And that seems to be a really important determinant in many of the symptoms that, for example, would explain why you have a sex difference in IBS between men and between, okay. and, uh -huh. and between men and women. Okay. And so you can use antibiotics to to change the 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 um, the experience in the in those models. Yeah. So what we what I'm saying to you is antibiotics changes how we experience pain in a sex dependent manner. Wow. And we think that you know hormones, bugs, and immunology are kind of the key thing to understand if you want to explain that observation. So that's one example. Uh -huh. But I think the estrobolome is really, really important. Well, well, we should talk about testosterone because that's equally yeah, important, yeah, right? Yeah. But but um, estrogen and progesterone seem to be um, modified by microbes, or at least there is that interaction. And we think that that might be a missing piece in the puzzle that explains why some, why some women are more likely to get polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh -huh. They're more likely to get endometriosis, mm -hmm. these really terrible conditions that affect a lot of women. And we just don't understand causation. Mm -hmm. And our therapies are kind of really lacking in them. Mm -hmm. And so we're quite excited about studying the microbiome in, 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 in that manner. Mm -hmm. um, so that there is clearly a, you know, the, the, you know, the world, the, the kind of medical word is dimorphism. There's a, there's a difference in the way that men and women experience lots of different diseases it's not just sure. you know sex specific diseases it's cardiovascular disease it might be dementia it might yeah. be you know there's there are societal reasons for that there's socioeconomic reasons for that but there are also 
biological reasons for that. And it seems that bugs, hormones, and immunology are a really important determinant of it. So, so do you f foresee, and, and uh, we're future casting here, so it's yeah. not something that you can just go out and start knocking up a probiotic yeah. concoction yourself right now, but uh, a scenario where we will be using uh, some sort of microbiota-directed therapy to treat some of these issues like PCOS and... Um, uh, and, and another uh, yeah hormonal. I absolutely do and and there is work going on around the world at the moment to do that uh -huh. okay. and because if you understand the detail of that relationship you can either knock down particular bacteria that might be driving you know causation or sure. you can promote beneficial microbes that might prevent it you may not even need the microbes you might be able to replicate their functions or to give individual molecules uh, that kind of bypass that whole interaction mm -hmm. but but you've got to understand, you've got to understand the mechanism. Uh, and, I, and I definitely think that is going to come. I also think that actually the key here, and in fact, this is a bigger point, I think the gift of the microbiome is not in treating diseases, it's in preventing diseases. Mm. So I want to know, like, can we just stop someone getting polycystic ovary syndrome in the first place? Because it's a pretty rubbish thing to have. Yeah. And I would argue that an important way of doing that is by really looking after human ecology sure. in very early life and probably from conception. Okay. And and we have a big problem with many of microbiome studies that look at these sorts of conditions because they look at the condition well after the horse has bolted. Like if you're studying the microbiome when someone's got endometriosis, sure, well, yeah. it's kind of yeah. you can derive some useful information. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do, but if you really want to understand causation mm. because of the evolutionary importance of the microbiome, because of the changes in the microbiome over a life course, I argue you've got to go. You've got to go back early in life, mm. which is why in my group we are cr increasingly studying infants. Like I'm a, I mean, I'm, I treat grown ups sometimes, um, <laughs> and. Um, but increasingly, I'm, I'm, I'm of the belief that if you want to understand a condition like, uh, you know, cancer or inflammatory bowel disease, another condition I study, you've got to go back. You've got to go back. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to miss it. Yeah. And with, re with regards to the issue of alone, uh, are there things that people can do now to sort of uh, create a more flourishing uh, microbiota that can uh, perhaps not completely get rid of PCOS and immune yeah. symptoms, but at least improve the ecology that could mitigate some of those issues? So I think there are, um, but but I think it's tricky to do that in a really directed way. Sure. But there are some common sense things to okay. do, right? And um, common sense things would be to, um, assuming that you've already worked with a gynecologist and you're getting all the kind of established medical therapy sure. that you need, would be to really think with, about your diet yeah. and to work with a dietitian because many foods that you will have will have high levels of phytoestrogens or yeah. food-based estrogens that will influence your symptoms and you can target those in a really specific way. It might be that you need more, it might be that you need less. Um, and I think you can look after the ecology of your gut, right? So that means doing many of the things that we've been talking about, but also it means you know, trying to avoid things that damage it. So the problem that many patients like this have is that they will go to their doctor with pain or with other symptoms, and quite often the output of that is an antibiotic. Mm, yeah. Right? And quite often, or for example, they get recurrent urinary tract infections, yeah. and the, the treatment is antibiotics, more antibiotics, more antibiotics. Yeah. And that just takes you further and further and further away. So, you know, my strategy in this is to try and measure what's going on. That's why I measure it, because at least you've got an objective, you know, some objective measure. And then to try and slowly um, wean um, off those antibiotics through nutrition, balanced, diverse diet, uh, thinking about all of those other kind of levers that we were talking about before, gut brain levers, yeah. hormone levers, these sorts of things to try and make that change. Yeah. Gosh, I, I can see that we're running out of time. So I want to try and make these yeah. quick fire, but these sure. are quick fire questions. Okay, well, I'll do my best. Yeah. So um, do, does the microbiota affect how we uh, taste foods and our food preferences? Oh, I love that. So yeah, it really does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it really does. And it, it does it in the most interesting ways. So your the oral microbiome is having a bit of a renaissance. We're, there's a lot of work in, yeah. in on it at the moment because we find bugs that come from the mouth in lots of different diseases. So we find them inside bowel cancers, we find them uh, in dementia, we yeah. find them in lots of gut brain issues. Mm. Um, but they they definitely influence taste because for kind of for some obvious ways. So bacteria in your mouth 
will metabolize and break down the foods that you eat and they will release taste molecules onto the onto the taste buds mm. but they they will also compete with other mi- bacteria and viruses in the mouth that um that might have a direct impact on your on your taste as well mm. um they change the immunology of the mouth and they will also influence you know different types of taste in in particular ways Interestingly, t- I find it interesting, again, I've said that a lot in this interview, uh, is that um, taste really has an evolutionary basis, of course, right? So taste is a defense mechanism. If you've got something that's bitter or awful, you know, it could be poisonous, it could be toxic. And microbes have likely informed that relationship. And actually, a lot of the actual receptors that live on the cell that determine taste actually live on your macrophages and your immune cells all throughout your body, right? And so I really think about the gut as a sensing organ. It's really just a giant sensing organ and it's tasting food, you know, uh, literally as a sort of, in an immunological way. Uh And it's sending hormones all of the time. Like, you know, but microbes are gonna influence your appetite, you know, how you think about uh, food in terms of maybe whether or not foods have certain addictive qualities, they might have an important role. And I, I don't have any evidence to support this. But I think that also they're playing quite an important role in pregnant women who suddenly get weird food. Really? You, know, the, you, know, you suddenly get that, I need gherkins yeah, and ice cream thing yeah, at three yeah. in the morning like my wife did. Like you, yeah. I just think, I think microbes are playing quite a big role in that. I think they're signaling saying, hey guys, we need gherkins. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what I think. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, we'll, see if, we'll, see if, we'll see if the truth, the truth comes to that. But yes, very, very important relationship between your microbiome taste and how you experience and think about food. It's influencing how you think about food before you're eating it. Do you think it's possible? And if, the, if it is possible, what, what, the, what do you think is the time period period for someone to retrain their taste buds to appreciate their quote-unquote healthier foods so the pulses the uh the 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 bitter leaves the the dark green leafy vegetables that kind of stuff and and do do you think like because the 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 issue that we have with the doctor's kitchen recipes is that we introduce a lot of that food but some people just don't like you know dark chocolate they don't like spinach for example yeah Is is there sort of a way in which any evidence that that says that you know if you stick to this for two weeks, let's say, yeah, your taste buds actually change and your microbiota actually forms a relationship with. I, I sort of have to be honest, and I don't know of any evidence around that. But what I do know is that within you know, because we've done these studies within within two weeks of making sustained dietary changes, your microbes will 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 change and their okay. functions will change. So it's plausible to me. Mm-hmm. Of course, there might be agents in that food which have really got nothing to do with bacteria, which are you know, having a direct impact on your taste buds and that actually you're just never really gonna get around to. Mm. But it's intuitive to me that if you make, you know, it's a bit like, it's a bit like treating an allergy. Like you don't just, you know, if you've got a peanut allergy and you wanna get over it, you don't just eat a big bowl of peanuts. Sure. That would be yeah, really yeah. silly yeah, yeah. and you would die, right? Yeah. And the taste is the same. Like you need to just slowly and incrementally make those changes and give your, your ecology time to catch up. Uh-huh. It's the same in IBS and like treating functional gut problems. Like the changes that you have to make to get back to a diverse type, you've really got to do slowly because those microbes have got to evolve. They've got to, they've got to grow back and then they've got to start switching on those met- metabolic functions to break down the foods that you're going to eat Mm -hmm. and it just takes a lot of time so i think you know it's intuitive to to me in that instance that you would just make very subtle and nuanced changes to the sorts of flavors that you're consuming and then build them up over time and who knows one day you might really enjoy it yeah yeah Yeah. i mean i certainly had to retrain my taste buds when i started transitioning to like a healthier palate and now i can't like think of a day where i don't crave yeah. greens and i i know i sound really weird by saying no, that but yeah. that's generally like how i feel and it, it didn't take that long for me um okay uh, vegetables yes uh, do they create uh the the same molecules that we find in uh, anti-obesity drugs so uh, the gop1 uh, no is- not at all so vegetables are much much better for you than anti-obesity drugs mm-hmm. and i really recommend vegetables <laughs> like to take have vegetables i mean what's interesting so you're you're referring to you know a, a class of medicines like a Zempic, I presume, right? So, which the way that they work is they block a lot of the hormones in the gut that signal mm-hmm. appetite, so they suppress appetite. What they also do is dramatically change your gut function. Mm. So uh, we've had lots of instances of patients being admitted with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and, and uh, really quite significant changes in your gut function. They very obviously change the microbiome, mm-hmm. not in a good way. Mm-hmm. And 
um, you know, it's much better not to be on these medicines if you possibly can. Okay. What vegetable vegetables, what fiber does, fiber works in a number of different ways. So first of all, it creates like a gel. It creates like a sort of soft scaffold, if you like, which sits in the gut. And that has some of its own physical and chemical properties. So it absorbs toxins. It takes toxins out of the guts. It might take a bunch of horrible bile acids that you don't want or, you know, secondary metabolites that aren't very nice produced by, you know, pro, you know animal protein f f uh, fermentation, for example. Um, but it also might have a, um, you know, a biomechanical effect on the gut that's quite happy. The gut doesn't like working too hard. And it has an immunological effect on the gut. Mm -hmm. And that is often mediated through microbes because fibres have um, a prebiotic function. So a prebiotic is a fibre that you can't digest, but that microbes can, that has a health benefit. So examples of that might be inulin or glatto oligosaccharides. Mm. And many of these fibres are found in plant-based foods, right? And, and they're just naturally, they're natural in plants. And so what happens is, is that microbes will break those down. And the secondary benefit of that comes from the small molecules that they okay. produce. So we mentioned in this chat, like short-chain fatty acids, really good example. Butyrate would be a really good example of that. Um, and of course, it also has lots of other goodies like polyphenols and these kind of plant-based molecules, mm. which microbes quite like uh, and have direct benefits, you know, in and of themselves. So we really like fiber. If you just have, I think my favorite fact is that if you just have seven grams of fiber per day, I think it's about two grams in an apple, something like that. Yeah, yeah, about two and a half yeah. apples a day, yeah. your risk of diabetes will go down, your risk of obesity will go down, your risk of cardiovascular disease will go down, your risk of cancer will go down, your risk of you know um, dementia will go down, everything will go down. Yeah. And we've known we've known about this, you know, since Burkett did his like really famous work in the 1970s. Yet yeah, it's so hard to do because it requires sustained behavior change. Yeah. And that's why your work is so important because it changes people's behavior and it makes eating vegetables sexy, which I think, yeah. is, which, which, I, which I think it is, Rufy. Really. I think it is. Yeah. Vegetable, yeah. yeah. But making vegetables yeah. sexy, that should yeah. be a tagline. It is. Yeah, I, think are sexy. I think they are sexy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did, did Romeo and Juliet get together because of their microbiome? <laughs> oh yeah like it, it had nothing to do with 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 shakespeare so so i think you've asked me that question because i think hormones uh we've talked about hormones and because microbes influence how hormones work uh, and because microbes influence how we look and how we smell mm. they produce pheromones and they modify our behavior mm. i think they have a role in mate selection like we know this from lots of other species and lots of other animals, which is the point I was making. So uh, I think I explained the, the study of the fruit fly where a fruit fly will mate based purely on pheromones. Yeah. And if you give it an antibiotic, it can't get a girlfriend. Yeah. Right? It just cannot yeah, yeah. mate. That's but crazy. then if you reintroduce just a single strain probiotic, suddenly it's sexy again and it can, ro it can procreate. And we've got lots of other examples of this throughout the animal kingdom. And I just think we're probably not quite as different in that regard mm. as we like to believe that we are. And, and the other point that I was making is that we, of, we often think about sex and sexual health in terms of pathogens. Like there are 80 million sexually transmitted infections in the US each year. They cause a lot of harm. Like if you're having a baby, we screen mothers for mm. pathogens because we know that those sexually transmitted pathogens will cause harm, right? But we don't think about the role that mutualists and commensals have in protecting us and, and keeping us um, healthy in terms of our sexual health. And we also don't think about the benefit that sex has in maintaining our, our microbes. Yeah. And so when you kiss someone, for example, like you, you know, you're a good snog will transfer about 80 million bacteria. <laughs> and there's an evolutionary benefit for it, right? Yeah. So like, you can go back and study like the transmission of microbes from Neanderthals, you know, into Homo sapiens, yeah. and we can track microbes evolving between the two, right? And, and sometimes they transmit functions that you might need. So for example, you know, metabolizing amylase in, in your mouth. So, so we just, we don't think about bacteria in, 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 in that sense. It comes back down to what I was saying about like a 19th century way about thinking about bugs, yeah. right? What I'm really arguing for in this book is like we evolve from germ theory into microbiome theory. Uh -huh. And what microbiome theory says is, yep, pathogens are bad. You've got to kill pathogens. They kill people that we don't want them, right? Mm. Like we're seeing an outbreak of monkeypox at the moment, mm. right, globally. It's a disaster. It's really bad. We need to stop that. But at the same time, microbial conservationism is a valid and really important way for promoting health and keeping us healthy. And that's the same in your sex life as it is in your aging strategy or, you know, your kind of day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Um, 
We're going to bring this to a close, but I, I wonder if we could, and there's so many things that you could talk about, but if yeah. there were three things, three takeaways that you could leave our audience with that they could start doing today with microbial conservation yeah. in mind, what, what would those what would those be? What, what are the top of mind things? So my number one is, is think very carefully about antibiotics. Okay. Antibiotics are an incredibly precious medicine. I'm not anti-antibiotics. I need them. I can't do my job without them, right? Um, and, and they save lives. Mm. But we equally misuse them. Mm. And so I would like you to think carefully about them, which means that if you're seeing your doctor because you've got a cold, make sure that you really need it before you take it because it might be viral and you might not need it. And the consequences of taking it are really, really important particularly if you've got kids and your kids are needing antibiotics. If your doctor says you really need it, you really need to take it, right? I don't want to be that you know extreme about it, but we just need to be quite careful about it. And I also want you to think about antibiotics in the foods that you eat. So when you're at the supermarket and you're about to buy that chicken, you're about to buy that steak, think about whether or not you can honestly say whether or not antibiotics have been used mm. unnecessarily in its, in its production. In the United Kingdom, Post Brexit, we were supposed to have a bunch of you know legislation come in to protect to protect us from this and animal husbandry, and it hasn't happened. Mm. So ask your butcher, ask your whoever you get your food from, have antibiotics been used in this, and what is the strategy for it? And I, I would really, you know, I think that's an actionable thing you can do. Yeah. And I think in the United Kingdom, we're behind the US on that. I think if you go to a US supermarket, you will see that they actually have quite commonly antibiotic information, mm. and we just don't do that enough in the UK at the moment. The second thing is fiber, 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 okay? Vegetables are sexy, eat more of it. Like you, there's a lot of this in the kind of zeitgeist at the moment about mm. plant-based foods. It's not made up, it's really true. And you don't need a fancy app and you don't need to spend a bunch of money on it. You just need to, you know, have the cooking repertoire and the time to really, you know, um, focus on it. And it will really, really help. Like it's just, it's gonna help you and you're gonna feel, you're gonna feel much, much, much better about it. And the third thing that I would really like to say is see your friends more. Mm. Okay, socialize, spend time with your, spend time with your family. I know family is not always the easiest, <laughs> but like actually, like you know, I think it's important. Like I think that um, we know that big family groups, big social networks, it's good for almost every aspect of your health. Yeah. Right? It's good for your mental health. It's good for your physical health. Uh, you're going to live longer. Uh, and a part of the reason for that, I believe, is that because you're going to have a more diverse microbiome. But I yeah. think there's lots of other kind of health benefits to it. So I think that would be my top three. Yeah. Gosh, this has been such an awesome conversation. Mm. I haven't gone through even half of the things that <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about because yeah. there's just so much in yeah. in the book. But I, I, I highly recommend everyone pick up the book, medics uh, especially, actually, because I think there's just a lot of groundwork knowledge that, all of us would benefit from uh, from knowing about and also like that's sort of being a platform to dive into it a little, a little bit more. Um, so it's brilliant. We're going to have oh. to have you to come back on again. Ricky, I need, I need no encouragement. I'll, I'll be back in a heartbeat. <laughs> You're going to have to cook for me though next yeah, time. Yeah, no, we'll definitely yeah. We'll do something yeah. in the kitchen. For oh, sure. I'd love that. Yeah, That'd yeah. be so fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll definitely really put point yeah. number two in, uh, yeah. uh, uh, into that. Five well, what we can do is we could come and sequence out your microbiome, Ricky. You can do a meal and we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> We've done that for my old yeah. microbiome with a friend of mine, yeah. actually, who's a, who's a dentist. Yeah. And she was pretty horrified, actually. Yeah. Apparently, I have a high sugar diet. Really? Yeah. If you like this episode on the Doctor's Kitchen podcast, you will absolutely love this episode that I did with Dr. William Lee. It is fascinating. We talk about food as medicine, all the different types of foods that can increase metabolism, as well as the defenses that food can provide to you. Check it out right now by clicking on the link.